We also, I would say in general, love our <laughs> Everything own material. <laughs> like, any, we'll be in a coffee shop writing, and we'll we always read it out loud to see how it sounds. Yeah, and we'll be like dying, laughing at our own jokes, high fiving. We like clear the communal table. Yeah, people hate us a lot. <laughs> you come to Republic of Pie, don't sit by us. You're listening to The Other 50%, A History of Hollywood. I'm Julie Harris-Walker. This is the podcast where I talk to successful women in entertainment and hear their stories. For this episode, I got to speak with Selena Warren and Marissa Reed. They are writers, showrunners, directors, and actors. Their current show on YouTube Red is called Foursome. They are hilarious and smart and are breaking the mold. We talked about how they learned to be showrunners and how they went about picking their new team. We also filmed this episode, so you can see part of it on YouTube. You can find us at theother50percent.com for added features, photos, show notes, the merchandise. And you can listen on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Podbay, and now on Spotify. Please subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen. And since podcasting thrives by word of mouth, please tell all your friends. Okay, here's Selena and Marissa. What is your job? We are writing partners. And we are showrunners and producers, and just this season on Foursome, we added directors. And things. actors. Right. <laughs> you are doing all of it. Yeah. Okay, so tell us the name of your show. It's called Foursome on YouTube Red. And you're with Awesomeness TV? That's who produced it, yes. So you are showrunners, actors, directors, writers, all of it. We're the yes. full Monty. <laughs> that is so awesome. How did you start, actually? Did you start as actors or as writers? Yeah, we started as actors. That's what we went to school for. Well, we went to school for musical theater. Yeah. Yay! Uh, like tap dancing and leotards. <laughs> My tap shoes are right. Oh. Um, and then we realized there wasn't much of a career in that. Um, unless you, like, you know, it's like a hard life. It's yeah. It's harder than... It's a hard knock life. It is. It's harder than this, for sure. So we decided to just strictly focus on acting. And did you go through any of the comedy schools? Yes. Yeah, Groundlings. You did Groundlings? Yeah, and I think I did one level of UCB right after Groundlings. How about you? I didn't go all the way through Groundlings, but I went up to, like, the last improv level, and then we ended up selling our show, so I didn't go back. Well, you don't have to brag about it. <laughs> <laughs> You know, actually, we didn't say uh, which one of you is which. I'm Selena. And I'm Marissa. Okay, great. Walk me through... You guys thought, we'll put on a show. And then how did you know how to navigate the system and sell it while you're still training? We were pitching con like consistently with our agents. They were setting up, our agent and manager was setting up at the time pitches for like different TV shows. Back up even before that. You're in acting school. Yeah, so we, we started auditioning for things and yeah. we really weren't getting a lot of auditions for parts that we would want to play. And we were like, we should start writing our own material, and we're hopeful that that would be, like, our way in. So you created the parts you wanted to see because you weren't seeing them. Right. Yeah. Do you remember any, like, audition notices that you would read and be like, really? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, if it was, say. which one? Horse woman. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I auditioned for the role of horse woman, um, which was for Paul Blart Mall Cop 2. Yeah. <laughs> and I was in the room with, like, all these actresses from, like, SNL and, like, that had been on SNL in, like, the 80s and 90s who I, like, loved. And I was like, what are we doing? It was such a sad moment because we were, like, riding a horse and we had, like, ten lines and just kind of shows you, like, what the comedic roles are for women. You're like, is this my future? Yeah. <laughs> then you wrote a show and you started pitching. Um, yes. So first we wrote a movie. Well, I had written a movie about my high school experience and Marissa read the opposite lead of me and my manager at the time was like, the two of you have chemistry, you should write together. And we were like, that sounds fun. So <laughs> we wrote a couple TV shows and then one of the shows ended up getting um, picked up by a production company and nothing ever happened with it. And we just started taking generals and we met with Awesomeness TV via a general. Yeah, and at first they were like, we pitched them a couple of ideas and we really didn't have anything for them because they were focused on like the preteen category mm -hmm. and all of our stuff was a little too raunchy for them. But a couple months later they called us back and they were hoping to do a teenage version of Sex and the City. Um, so they interviewed probably like 10 people or 10 different writing teams 
and we ended up getting the job. We pitched on it. We wrote the pilot in like a couple days and we're like, this is how fast we can go. And we got the job and that's kind of how it all started. And this became foursome? That was yeah. foursome, yeah. Can I ask how old were you at this point? 25. Oh my God. <laughs> Actually, 24. 24. Yeah. Okay, how thrilling was that? Or did you think, oh, this is just how it works? It's hard to know what's <laughs> real, you know? Like, as soon as it got sold, we're like, okay, well, I won't believe it until I get a paycheck. And then it's like, yeah. I won't believe it until it's in production. And then it's like, I won't get excited until it's airing. Like, it's I hard to know what's real. I excited season three. Right. <laughs> so, like, I think it was, like, a slow burn for us. I think, like, the big moment of excitement was when we got to set and we saw the sets built. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we saw the actors, like, reading our words. And then I think we were like... This is real. This is so cool. Oh, my God. It's great. Yeah. yeah. And looking at it, um, it looks like there's some money behind it. Yeah. Like it's, it's got very decent. Together. Totally. It's got decent budgets. Yeah. yeah. YouTube Red distributes it. So the first season was fully funded by Austinist TV, and then YouTube Red jumped in season two and three. Fantastic. Yeah. Are you going to do season four? We don't know. Is that still in the air? <laughs> we ha well, we have to air first and yeah. see if we get picked up, and I guess we'll just like take it from there. Yeah. And you both are in it too, aren't you? <laughs> in a very small, <laughs> we strange have small way. Roles. We're stoner lesbians. So. Well. <laughs> <laughs> so the story is that we created two of the main parts for ourselves, mm -hmm. and we um. Basically, it's that old story that, like, once you're seen a certain way, if you're seen as a writer, then they don't see you as an actor yeah. unless it's in your contract from the beginning. And we kind of learned that by default. Um, they kept saying, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe. And then we started realizing it's not going to happen. You're like, but guys, we love yeah. this for ourselves. Exactly. But, you know, it, it you have to present yourself as a creator, actor, from, from the, the very start yeah. before you sign your contract. And this was a stepping stone, so we didn't want to, like, say no yeah. at the time um and it was a great learning experience just like for that because we'll never do that again unless we know up front okay if they say maybe that's a no just know it's a no yeah and it's still worth it then we'll do it right yeah so we didn't know that at the time that was like really hard for us especially seeing the auditions and um you know they wanted people with social media followings and they wanted people that were influencers because that's you know what they do so and are you watching auditions like that's really not how I meant it when I wrote it like that's not how you're supposed to say that line <laughs> yeah in the beginning but once we cast the roles we really just changed the writing to suit the actors and it ended up being a good collaboration honestly like we're happy with the people that were cast and the actors ended up like blowing us away like I yeah. think it was such a good learning experience kind of having a hang up about social media influencers mm -hmm. and being like well they're not real actors right. and then like Jen who's our lead like on the hiatus from season one to two she like went to UCB and went to Leslie Kahn and like studied and she's so amazing like and she set the bar so high that we were like well yeah there is sometimes there is no difference if you're that hard of a worker and you put that much effort in it's clearly going to show and then she won the streamy for best actress that's great that's the thing if you're a social media influencer you are working your ass off yeah like we really didn't workers. know what goes into making youtube videos yeah it's, it's unbelievable yeah i think it's, it's a not lot accidental. It's, a, it's a job yeah. yeah like they're every day oh yeah doing the work so it makes sense that then if they have any talent at all they can focus that into learning how to act absolutely totally that's and sometimes not <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do when that happens do you write around it? Yeah. We've never had a lead character that that's been the situation. Let's just be clear, they're not talking about their cast. Yeah, like, everyone in our cast is <laughs> has been wonderful and amazing and, like, is awesome. Um, I think in, like, a couple of tiny parts where it was influencer-based, you know, we just write, to their, they have their own strengths. Mm -hmm. And, like, it yeah. happens with regular actors, too. You, somebody gets hired that somebody likes that maybe you don't understand the choice and then you just, like, curve to write to them. That's you know, as a showrunner, that's on us, not on them. Yeah, totally. So did you hire a writer's room? Yeah, season one, we wrote the entire season, just the two of us. We didn't have a writing room. How and many then episodes? Six. Okay, six 22-minute episodes. And then season two and three, we had a writing room that we interviewed and hired writers. How many? Uh, one writing team and then two writers, right? One writing right. team, one writer, and a writing assistant. Right. Now, had you ever been in someone else's writing room? No. 
So you created your own writing room? But that's not true, I guess. I I very briefly was on Ridiculousness season four, but that was not a traditional writing room. That's a lot of stand-ups doing joke passes on clips. Mm. So we had never been in like a traditional writing yeah, room. Yeah, that was the first writing room I had ever like even physically seen. Yeah, so how did you think it, or did you think about how you're going to set up your culture, set up your writer, set it up so that you could get the best work out of everyone. Yeah, I would say season two was a big learning experience. <laughs> we were kind of just like in over our head and, and learning as we went. And then season three, we like set up rules. We mapped out the entire eight weeks, ten weeks, whatever we were doing. Ten weeks. We went to a show running conference at the WGA that you had to like apply to get in. And um, we got in and it was like a crash course. It was a little old school. Um, it was like <laughs> how to run a CBS multicam. Yeah. Um, but we kind of took stuff from there. And they also have, you know, network shows have like triple, quadruple the amount of time that we had. Yeah. yeah. Um, we were in the writing room 10 weeks for 10 episodes before we started shooting. So we went, we just like kind of t- timed everything by eight and just went really fast. So you have to reinvent it a little bit. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Did you get a mentor or did they assign like some seasoned executive producer with you or did they just say no, go for it? They kind of just said go for it, which <laughs> was honestly great because yeah. it was such a learning experience. And I don't think that's a, the norm for a lot of networks that they would just let you <laughs> be the first time showrunner <laughs> and have that much control. So it was it was great. Yeah, they were really great about giving us creative control and like, you know, if we really fought for something, they would make it happen. So it was a creatively fulfilling experience. Yeah. That sounds amazing. Yeah. What did you, what do you wish you would have known going into it that you figured out along the way, maybe the hard way? I think just preparing ahead of time, having as much um, organized before we started the writing room, because that really helped us season three. So did you already know like the arc you wanted to go down and kind of yeah I mean it wasn't like approved or anything and it really needed to be fleshed out but we had like a general arc for the season and like each character what what kind of their journey would be. We didn't know if a character was coming back a main character and she ended up actually not returning so that I think is like there's a monkey wrench. Yeah yeah there was a couple (laughs) big monkey wrenches like we don't have them tied down we had like a whole storyline for a villain and he ended up not being able to do it because he booked something else so we had a couple moments where we were like all right just take that week and put it in the trash and start over. There was a lot of redoing. But we really didn't get frustrated we kind of just were like let's we didn't get frustrated until we were on set like we didn't let things get, get us until later on so I think we handled it pretty well in the writing room you just got to roll with it we rolled with it that was a good learning experience too because we would like argue for things season one and two like anytime we get a note that we disagreed with we would argue with it and then ultimately have to end up doing it anyway so by the end (laughs) we were like we'll just take every note and do our version of it and it was so much less energy yeah I'm our execs sure, were like we'll <laughs> they took us to nobu because they were like you guys were so great that's right because usually we're like a little bit of a pain in the ass um they were like you're so awesome we were like yeah we just said yes to everybody i think it made them nervous like anytime they would call with bad news they'd like wait for us to rep and we'd be like okay we'll figure it out and they're like you girls okay do you need someone to like stop by they're like everything's great <laughs> See you later. <laughs> you just made it work. It yeah. had we had to because it's like we got so worked up first and second season, and it d- does nothing but hurt yourself. Yeah, it was got to be so stressful. It if is. you let if you let it be, like when we started to calm ourselves down and like be like, just how do we work the problem and like make it fun? Mm-hmm. It was a much more enjoyable experience. And then the end, it's like, you know teen comedy so like don't get don't get so, don't get so worked up, up. It. yeah, yeah. Like, try to keep it in perspective what yeah you're doing like <laughs> enormous opportunity and it's television yeah it right? should be fun especially this experience where it's like a little less um pressure should be fun yeah it's not a cbs procedural you don't right. we don't have a network that's like breathing down our necks right. being like you have to hit whatever what our views are great we so it's and, not three million dollars an episode and you have to hit certain numbers right to make it. right yeah you said you're also directors this season. Yeah, we were. It was we directed one thing before it, which was like a um, pilot presentation that we were starring in. Um, but other than that, this was our first time ever doing like a full episode of something and us not acting in it. So we were, you know, really behind the camera. Did you co-direct? Yes, we did. Did you? How many episodes? One. one? That's all we had time for. <laughs> show running and EP. We were like really the only EPs plus another person. This guy Sev. 
O'Ranahan. He's going to be so mad when he hears the pronunciation of his last name. <laughs> he loves Glendale. He loves Glendale. He'll also be mad. Who we- doesn't? <laughs> In our meeting, he only talked about Glendale, so we called him Glendale the whole <laughs> season. That's hilarious. Um, but Does he live in Glendale? No. <laughs> no, but we always think he does. Like, we forget that he doesn't live there. He just goes there for fun. He made a movie about Glendale and premiered it in Glendale and was like, you guys, it was huge in Glendale. And we were like, who cares? Like, we just made fun of him. We are like, who cares? We're like, you just said Glendale so many times. <laughs> so as we got to know him, we started razzing him. But he, Awesomeness TV brought him on as a producer because um, all of, like, our producers that had been there prior that were, you know, represented the studio were on other shows, so they brought him on as, like, an outside producer. Like a line producer? Yeah. Yeah. He was there to make sure that we didn't go into overtime and, like, kind of... Yeah. And then he gave some creative notes, but quickly got frustrated with how he took them, <laughs> so just mainly stuck to... So his notes you didn't take? Uh, we took maybe a couple of You'd them. have to ask him. I'd yeah, say, we'd, say we, we'd say we took him, and he said we laughed in his face and ignored him. <laughs> Whatever works. Yeah. Okay, so how was the conversation where you said, okay, we're ready to direct? We, let's see, going into season three, I think it was part of our negotiation. Our deal. Yeah, we wanted to be able to direct. And they were like, no. <laughs> <laughs> Did they say why or just? Well, yeah. at the time, I mean, Brian Robbins was there at this time. He just was like, let's just see how it goes. You know, you guys are show running the show. Maybe. It wasn't it was a maybe. no. Yeah, it was like a we'll see how it goes scenario which means no which we were like our experience has meant no so we were a little weary we were like it's not gonna happen and then it did they were so wonderful and we're like here you go although it's very stressful because of the episode um ended up being the last episode written and we didn't know if a main character was gonna be it was a very very stressful we ended up not having it completed like the episode completed until like a week before like we didn't even get to do a production meeting and like go through all the normal steps so it was stressful, but the actual experience of directing was awesome. Yeah, we loved directing it. by the seat of your pants. Very much. We did have a mentor for directing, though, and he was super helpful. Bennett Silverman, he's amazing. He's um, came on for the second season to direct two blocks, and he was quickly became like our close friend, and also just as like I hate to say, it's rare to have a young man believe in young women and like. I find directors to be a little bit competitive. Yeah. Um, and he was, like, so great about it. He was like, I'll mentor you. He continuously reaches out and, like, helps us with jobs. He's great. Yeah. It was, like, in order for us to get to direct, we needed a mentor. So he just stepped right in, like, no hesitation about it. And we're such different directors. He's very much technical. Yeah. Yeah. Like, he knows, like, every, like, lens and Yeah, he, he's got a vision, but he c- communicates that vision very much through the camera and through mm. the DP, and we're just like, make it crazy, <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, we relate more to the actors, I think, just because yeah. we have a background in that. He so. wanted to take an acting class with us, actually, which I would pay big money to see. Yeah. Because he's very we dry. Take him up. Yeah. That's really fun. How did you prepare differently to direct... Well, we asked all of the directors on our show for their... Um, Shot list. Yeah. And we kind of did our version of a combination of a lot of directors' shot lists. Um, we tried to be as prepared as possible because we were new to it, so we didn't want to leave a lot up to chance on the day of. We were, I think, incredibly prepared. I mean, our bi- we had... We made um, visuals for, like, where the camera angles were going to be, and we only had to throw away two because of time. Because you, we only, you know, you only had like four setups per scene, and sometimes I think we only were allowed to do two because we were moving so quickly. Mm-hmm. We had a, we lost a day on our block, and we ended up having to, sh- an act because of an actor availability, half of our things had to be sh- shot by one director, and we had to shoot the other half of the scene ourselves. So we had to like match lighting and uh, and use easy. a stand-in yeah. on our first <laughs> yeah. time, and we were like, yeah. this might be crazy, but it ended up turning out really well. We actually, like, went into the sets on our off time and, like, set up all the camera angles on our iPhone and, like, pieced it together to make sure that we had, like, all the dialogue covered. It was great. So you guys prepared. We prepared yeah. hard for directing. Now, your set in general, what's the makeup of it? Men, women? For crew, I would say it's a lot of men, but... Last, second season, there were... Our, um, our B camera op was a woman. Um, this season, our, like... Um, line producer was a woman. One of the camera 
team was a woman, our scripty was a woman. A lot of above the line. All above women. the line, yeah. Like our our higher ups at Awesomeness TV, there's a lot of women. Yeah. Right? They're they're really great about hiring women and giving women opportunities. We had um, this season we were directing as well as another female director. And season one and two we had a female director. And season one was all this one woman, Amy York Rubin, who directed the entire first season, which now that we've directed, I'm like, how did you possibly, <laughs> possibly do that? Uh, she's also incredible. Um, but, yeah, I think it's a really healthy balance. Yeah, that's great. Now, are you guys working on other projects? Yeah, we're pitching a project right now. <laughs> we're laughing because a lot of people have said no to it. We're on our <laughs> last pitch. Yeah, we have one left, yeah, so fingers crossed. Yes. Yeah, that's... That's true. And then our, we just signed with a new manager, and she was like, okay, this is it, babes. This no one's, pressure. <laughs> this one's a no. We're going to... And then on to the next Yeah. One. I think it's better that way. You don't want to beat a horse. What, what is the expression? Beat, beat a, a dead, dead horse. horse. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Horrible how, expression. How is it uh, pitching in the rooms? What kind of reception do you get? Um, I mean, I would say the hardest note that we get, because it, <laughs> there's nothing we can do about it, is that networks and cable, they don't want to pick up multiple shows that have female leads. Like, if they already have a show so with female leads. one is enough? Exactly. It's, like, it's always too similar to what they already have. The, um, Comedy Central, like, this was maybe three years ago, told us, we love your show. It's just, like, our demographic is guys and you're two women. And, you know, their most mm -hmm. successful, successful shows right now, Broad, Broad City, City, Amy Schumer a couple years ago, you know. Yeah. It's just funny. You know, it's funny that... Uh, did you guys see the study that came out this week through the Lean In organization and McKinsey where the way men and women look at equality is so different? Like men think there's parity if there's one out of ten women as an executive and women see 30% and think that's equal. Wow. Just the way people look at it. Yeah, there's one show by a woman, so we're, we're well represented. It's exactly. crazy. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's just interesting that like just because a show has female leads, they automatically think that it's similar to another show with female leads. And it's only for women? Right. right. Like, w in what world did you say, oh, we already have a show with a white guy? Yeah, that's all yeah. of TV. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's a totally different series and idea. Um, I will say we did just go back to Comedy Central, and it was a wonderful experience. And it was actually a woman who we're, we were pitching to, and... Our show was too similar to one of their shows, and it actually was. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we were like, "All right, we'll take it this Fair time." Fair enough. Yeah. Um, so that's that's hard. And then also, uh, Marissa and I are we go by S and M. We're very kitschy. We say things at the same time a lot of the time, most of the time, not on purpose. Um, we have higher registered voices. We're on the younger side for showrunners. All of that intolerable. And people really don't <laughs> like it. They think we're doing a bit or they're, you know. They think we're putting on a, our personality. Like, it doesn't seem genuine to you them. You can't be taken seriously if you're a bubbly woman. You know what I mean? You have to, like, lower your voice and talk yeah. numbers in order for someone to be like, well, you can run a show. If we say. Put on your newscaster yeah, voice. Yeah, right. And you can't wear overalls. Right. And we just, like, work. Those are darling. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> they're velvet, so they're extra overall -y. Um... So it's just been, that's been a challenge, mm -hmm. trying to, like, you know, just be ourselves, but also sell things. So it's hard, because you do yeah. find yourself Are you adjusting? adjusting. Yeah, definitely. Do you consciously go in and say, okay, I'm going to be, like, super serious in this meeting, like, back me up? We'll read the room, I think. Yeah. <laughs> we definitely toned it down, though. Like, when we first started pitching, we were 22. Yeah. And we would dress in, like, completely matching outfits on purpose we would like say high girl, five yeah, say girl power and high five in the middle of our pitch like we did tone it down we were selling high school and like college and raunch and like we felt like it was part of it but yeah. still they felt like it was too much they it was unprofessional that you can handle their money that's then. right because at the end of the day which right, is a bummer because good is good you know what i mean like yeah. we always pitch with a full pitch with visuals um, we always have a full Bible of at least seven episodes ready to go before we walk in the room, and we usually have the pilot written. So you're delivering the goods. Yeah. You're just cracking open their mold of what they think you should look, right. act, and behave like. It's how we deliver it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of want you to keep doing it. Like, it's so subversive. <laughs> we, I mean, there's no, there's no, we're not, I guess we're not good enough actresses to go in and be like, 
hello, like even with like <laughs> a full. Right now. How, like, how would that look? Hello. <laughs> like I can't. Even with like a full suit and glasses, like right. it would look like I was playing dress up. I'm five two, and you know what I mean. It's not organic to who we are to be like these proper business women. So we we still have a bit of that. Because it, it's funny to expect to have it both ways. Because they want you to be the creative and the actors and the and the artists and be the business people at the same time. But that's the thing about a lot of writers that we've met at the WGA. It's like, you know, mainly white guys with hoodies and like that whole stereotype is true. And like a lot of them are introverted or, you know, intellectual and a little quiet. And the women that we've met there that are primarily writers share a little bit of that we've met. Uh, one writing team who did Eva Longoria's show, the new one, <laughs> um, telenovela. They're the yes. showrunners on that. Oh, yeah. They're very bubbly, and they spoke to us and were like, "Don't lose who you are. Be who, like." They, and they represented that to us. And they're primarily writers; they're not actresses as well. So that was one of the only examples that we saw of people that were a little bit eccentric that mm-hmm. are yeah. show running. We actually had a mentor through the WGA that told us like. We weren't even doing a pitch or anything where we were just at dinner and they told us change our personality to, to or... really like tone down our personalities. People won't take us seriously. It was really shocking to us. <laughs> yeah. Mm. We don't like that stuff just kind of rolls off our shoulders because we're like, we can't. We can't change like who we are. <laughs> I feel like I'm pretty sure it's going to work out. Yeah. It'll Anyhow. Be, I mean, it has to otherwise like we'll just try forever as who we are until we succeed. Or we'll just die not be successful. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you're doing it already. Thanks. You're doing it. You know, a lot like a lot of our friends, like when we complain about where we're at, they're like, "Oh, wow, wow, wow!" You've got, yeah. you know, you're me a river. Exactly, but it's hard, especially right now. We're in this place where we feel very discouraged, and you know, we're stressing out every single day, and like obviously puts the world that we live in puts things in perspective. Yeah. So it's kind of just heavy on top of heavy. Because you've got to get your second thing. To we really we got to get what's next. Yeah. Right. And I think that just any artist in general has that in them where it's like you're not celebrating what you're doing right now. You're, you're like anticipating the next thing. You just want to keep the ball rolling, you know? Yeah. Our dream would be to either be a production company housed at a studio so you just know that you've got a future as opposed to like living by the seat of your pants like we've got that movie that I wrote when I was the first thing I ever wrote about my high school experience Marissa and I actually decided to come together somebody asked us for a sample that was a little more dramatic and we were like well we could redo this and we both took she was on palms I was on palms in high school we both took our experiences and combined them and made the movie very specific it's like about the north shore I grew up in Deerfield Illinois which is where the uh, Mean Girls is based on. So there was a big powder puff football game when I was in seventh grade in, with the high schoolers, and a bunch of girls ended up getting su- suspended and expelled for hazing, extreme hazing. In seventh grade? Uh, hi- they were in high school. I had just moved so to she this was area. In so I was in seventh grade. And you're looking happened. at the high school like, great. I'm looking at this whole area. I grew up, both of us grew up loving rom coms. Like, She's all that and 10 Things I Hate About You mm-hmm. and John Hughes movies even before then. And we both were like, oh, that's what high school is going to be. Yeah. It's like a formula of what you have to do to be popular. Yeah, we were very specific. And then I moved. I always thought those movies made high school look so scary. Like, I wanted no part of high school from watching movies. We, we felt the opposite, which is why we wanted to, <laughs> we, which is why we wanted to do this movie because there's so many girls like us that I think are like, it's going to be like this. And then are like a little let down that yeah. it's not as horrible as some of the things in the movie. <laughs> and that's a perspective we hadn't seen. So when I moved, all of these girls were in juicy couture suits with stick straight hair. It was very specific, and academia was cool. Like, if you were not getting straight A's or doing well in school, you were an outcast. It was a very backwards oh, world, and cheerleaders were losers, and palms was cool. You're like, wait a minute, I was all ready to be popular. Exactly. And Marissa grew up in a very hippie town, so she had, like, that where did you At, grow up? Yeah, I grew up in Bellingham, Washington. Oh, I'm from Seattle. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. yeah. See, so you know it. <laughs> yeah, but we both... But maybe everybody doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bellingham. Yeah. Right. It's on the Canadian border. It's definitely, like, a specific type of person that lives in Bellingham. It's all, like, local, organic, 
So wanting to be, like, a popular cheerleader there, you're a little oh, bit no, of an no, outsider. No. It's like literally stoners are cool. Yeah, where's your Birkenstocks and your <laughs> flannel? I actually brought Birkenstocks to this Same. meeting. Birkenstocks were cool in Deerfield. <laughs> um, so we both took our experience and wrote, the um, like, a Ferris Bueller homage where we spoke directly to the camera, and the lead character's name is Selena and Marissa. It's about two best friends who are, like, fighting the system. It's about being hazed but enjoying it and ruining the hazing experience for the hazer um and it i love it no this the person that we wrote it for the production company was like they hated it and our team hated it so we were like at the time we're not with them anymore so we've decided to put it up on the blacklist mm -hmm. which is this incredible tool for yes. writers right especially if you don't have representation and it was kind of just like hold on yeah how do you get it on the can you submit There's two it different the types black of blacklist. There's the blacklist blacklist with it, which is which the assistants make. Which right. the assistants make. But the person that founded that, Franklin Leonard, started this website for people that don't have managers sending their scripts out. That okay. wouldn't even be so. It's so you can just upload your script for a fee, okay. and then you get evaluations. And so after we uploaded Hazed, kind of as a last ditch effort because our whole team wasn't on board we immediately shot to number one on the block list. We got like the highest rating of anyone on the website. Mm -hmm. For the month of January. And so they continued to, they, they funded us to keep it up there. They sponsored a poster. An artist like illustrated the poster of it. And then we got all these um, option offers. We got three option offers for the movie. That's how you do it. And we said no to all of them because <laughs> they didn't want us to act in it. Oh, so you're holding out. Well, and we also felt like we hadn't even tried to take the script out, so like, yeah. you know, we might, might as well away. try to have someone say yes first. To us, this was our Rocky, you know, especially for me. I mean, Marissa's got some more stories, I think, from her <laughs> childhood, but like, for me, this was my Rocky. This is all I got. Yeah. So to sell it and not be acting in it, for me, felt like a goodbye to acting, and I wasn't quite ready to do that. So we, um, we told that to our team at the time, and they were all very disappointed and they said you know this was a huge but mistake when you're saying your team do you mean your managers agents, agents? yeah mm -hmm. okay and they want to make the sale they want to make right. the sale. Care. of course <laughs> and we fired everyone in one fail swoop with no other prospects <laughs> we were like okay well now what and then that was a ballsy move yeah we just felt like we had to and it took us eight years to do it about <laughs> true well it seems like they're not really on your team that's how exactly. we felt. It didn't feel like they were seeing the trajectory of our career that we wanted. Yeah. So did you get a new team? Got a new, new team. team. We are with UTA and PYE now, and UTA, within a week of signing with them, got the movie with a production company who's planning on making it in March, and hopefully we'll star in it. Yeah. So it worked that out. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> that, you're ballsy chicks. Sometimes I feel like we're not ballsy <laughs> enough. We're passionate, I think. It depends on the situation whether we're ballsy or not. I think we speak our mind, but sometimes I feel like, especially with our agents, or, you know, we, there's a lot of, hey, I'm sorry, but, like, you know, a little trepidation where we should just be like, hey. It's a balance that we're still learning, I think. <laughs> but I think it's extraordinary that you're in the machine and you're still very much believing in yourselves in a system that would try to have you not believe in yourself at all yeah it's hard like we said like right now is a tough time for us emotionally and confidence wise I think you're gonna do it thanks, thanks. just hang in there <laughs> we were fishing <laughs> <laughs> I think you guys are so smart and talented oh, and so pretty <laughs> um tell me this because we are in the um I was going to say week, probably month, probably three months of the Harvey of it all. How is that hitting you guys and hitting, if you could speak for your whole generation, yes. that would be really helpful. They love to rely on us for the voice. <laughs> <laughs> They've elected you the representative. Yeah. So what are, what are the 20-something women feeling about this, or you specifically? I How's mean, it hitting you? I think for me it's been a lot of reflection on – you know, incidents that you brush off is not a big deal. Mm -hmm. And the power you have and taking that power, um, yeah, I think it's been a lot of reflection for me. Same. I mean, 
we just went through an experience where we cried sexism for the first time in our professional career, and it was incredibly difficult. Yeah, what did it look like? Um, it looked like, it's, we have to be careful. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> See, that's the thing, we have to be careful. Yeah, it looked like not being heard, which I think is the struggle, Typical. and being looked over once again, I think because we're women, because of our youth, because of the way we talk. I think it has to do with all of that. And when we called it out, it, you know, I think it comes with, like, how dare you? How dare you? Yeah, right. it's like... That's not it at all. That, yeah, you're... And then getting mansplained, too, which is, you know... Like, I think it just... It made us... It made our eyes open for the first time to be like, oh, this is sexism. This isn't just being unfair. This isn't... You know, sometimes I think, especially early on in our careers, we're like, oh, bummer they didn't like it, or they didn't like the show, or they didn't like us. You accept it on the face of it. Yeah. And now I think we're starting to see. It's little things, too, though. It's like, it just opens your eyes to, like, a guy coming up to you and massaging your shoulders when you're trying to do your job. And it's like, would you do that if I was a man? I don't think you would. That's always the question. And the answer is usually no. And we're hypersexual. I mean, not hypersexual. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. Say that again. Our language. language. Our language is hypersexual, you know, and our show is hypersexual and R-rated and raunchy. And some people make assumptions. The well, not even assumptions. Like the line of what's professional and what's joking around is very blurred on our set, yeah. so it's confusing for people, which I totally understand. So we're very much willing like when someone's massaging our shoulders to be like hey that makes me uncomfortable like we're we feel comfortable enough yeah because we're setting the tone on this show that's with a lot of young people behind mm-hmm. the camera and in front and you're the bosses yeah it's an environment that we created so yeah, it's, a, it's a beast of our we own ha- making. yeah we have to be the ones to define where the line is yeah so we just try to be honest with the people as the situations occur until they get so out of hand that we feel like we need to get the company involved. Right. Have you had to? One time. Do you want to talk about it? I think that one, no. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) But it was handled? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we were honest about our feelings. We reported something that made us uncomfortable, and it and all parties are aware, and that's all you can do. Yeah. So you have to make it really clear, like, that is happening on set in the scene... And that is not how you treat me, your executive producer. Yeah. And it, I mean, sometimes I feel like I don't even recognize that something was wrong until like two days later. Like in the moment I laugh at it, you know? And then you think back and you're like, wait a minute. Yeah. And I guess that's what, it's become blurry because it's such a sensitive time. Mm-hmm. Um, and you don't want to, you know, I wrote Me Too on my Facebook page, like a lot of, women and it was very difficult because it's like when you're in that moment you don't want to be overly dramatic you're like am I taking this too seriously was it a joke did they mean anything by it is he a bad person he or she um and did I set the tone for this so do I kind of just have to relax a little bit and that's for me why having a partner has been so wonderful is because I can balance that off of Marissa and yeah. there's strength in numbers which obviously we've seen with the Me Too moment so yeah. we feel more comfortable saying something I don't know if I would have felt as comfortable yeah, that's a good point saying something without her yeah isn't it funny and when you think about degrees you see some stories of are you hearing about the women who are raped or whatever and you're like well my story is not that do I still put Me Too like and I found like I've been conflating now because you know once you see things you can't unsee them what is sexual harassment and what is just gender bias and Mm -hmm. i'm equally enraged by both now (laughs) so even when you see gender bias it's like really like that is such an affront absolutely i think like it's so tricky it's you know we're in this i think the fact that we're talking about it and making people aware of it is great and that's only going to make things better in the future. Yeah, totally. I, it does play into it being power in numbers. I mean, like, for me, I know I didn't write Me Too on my Facebook, and that's such a small task to do until I saw several of my friends did. Yeah. I hesitated. It was a little scary and vulnerable just doing that, which seems like such a small right. thing. 
but then everybody did it. Right, which is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of the point. It feels like it's a really big moment we're having. I think so, yeah. too. I think that we're shedding a light on things from the woman at Amazon complaining about the head of Amazon to all the women that are coming out to the fact that I hear women in coffee shops speaking about it now every single day. Like, I think that it's a good time to start a discussion, yeah. and we definitely don't have the answers, but we just know that we take things on a what we're comfortable with yeah. basis, and we're comfortable with a lot, so yeah. it's yeah, tricky. We're a specific <laughs> case, I think, like where we draw the line. Where do you draw the line? I think Respect. When, yeah, I think it has to come down to respect and, you know, feeling, feeling like you're not valued. And that's where we draw the line. Like, um, yeah. I, I mean, I hate... I was kind of kidding asking that question, but I'm glad you came up with an answer. I hate to <laughs> say, like, if you, made, if you made a comment about my tits, which happens... I used to have very large breasts. I got a breast, re- breast reduction a year ago, and the, there's been a pretty huge difference in the way I'm treated and looked at and talked to. Isn't that interesting? I mean, no. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's something I've dealt with forever. Yeah. Um... But, like, I think I will have – I guess the whole point is that you shouldn't do it no matter what. You shouldn't be talking about anyone's breasts on yeah. set. But sometimes for our show when, like, our lead character has to be in pasties and we're like, well, how much boob is too much boob? Is it like this? You know, you are talking about breasts and you're joking around trying to make it light. Exactly. Yeah. Like, our our actress is sitting there in, the, in pasties and it's like you make jokes to make the environment more comfortable for everyone. Yeah, it's it's really it's, awkward. <laughs> it's strange. And we, I've been especially trying to make, the, you know, we call them the kids. They're not kids. They started this when they were 18. <laughs> we were, like, two years older than them. But we, were, we always call them the kids. And like, Actually, some of them are older than us. Yeah, that's, we still call them the kids. They're all our kids. <laughs> but we, I used to, like, joke. I still do. Joke around with them. Like, mm, your little teen skin. Like, I would make jokes. <laughs> Like, you smell like a teenager, you know what I mean? And, like, now... <laughs> the old lady on the set. Yeah, like, trying to, you know, joke around because she's uncomfortable doing these stuff, you know, just trying to keep it light and fun and stuff. But if, I mean, I could have... She wasn't, thank God, but, like, I could have made her very uncomfortable and she could have complained and I could have gotten in trouble. Like, I think... Well, and if you were a 50-year-old man, it, it might It wouldn't be, be acceptable, right? No. Right, but, like, then you ask yourself the question, is it acceptable for a 25-year-old girl to do? You know, there, I think you just have to... That's Ooh, why it's so tricky. Yeah. yeah. It's like we're friends, but I'm also, we made the mistake very early on of putting front, being, coming friends with them and like yeah. hanging out and stuff instead of being the boss. And right. we had to transition into the boss after that was already established. So how did you do that? <laughs> well, like <laughs> season one, we literally would, instead of being behind the monitor, giving notes and doing our job, we would sneak off to like hang out with them in between scenes. So limiting that was key I think like just focusing on doing our job yeah stop smoking behind the dumpster yeah (laughs) exactly and like I we stopped going out with them Mm. on the weekends Mm -hmm. during this last couple seasons and also our responsibilities grew so like we just didn't have time we were literally behind the camera we had to be because we were the only producers there you had to put some professional boundaries yeah in place Yeah. yeah it's just hard to kind of work backwards and put the boundaries after you've established yeah. what your relationship is. You did it, though. <laughs> you have to ask them. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I'm gonna yeah, all of that. exactly. Glad you guys. Tell me this. Are you a success? Are we a success? I would say it depends on your definition of success. For myself, for my own definition, no. How do you define it? I think success for me would be consistently working. In the bigger sense, success is achieving the goals I set out for myself. And I've met the small ones, but not, mm-hmm. I think, like the overall feeling of being a working actor and writer. And like, I, are you not going to feel successful until you've accomplished all your goals? I just don't know, like, honestly, if we'll ever feel successful. <laughs> like, I just think it's, like, constantly yeah. reaching for the next thing. Yeah. It's tricky. Because you think, like, okay, I won't be happy until I'm with this agency and then you get with that agency and you're like I won't be happy until I sell a show and then you sell a show and you're like until I'm starring in a show like you just constantly (laughs) make the next goal and it doesn't have enough viewers it has to be network oh Netflix is cool it has to be Netflix you're constantly (laughs) comparing yourself against other people and it's that's I would say the hardest one of the hardest things about this industry who do you really look up to who do you want to be 
We look up to Tina, Tina Fey and Amy Fuller. Fuller. I know, aren't they the greatest? They're the greatest. Um, we love their shows. I mean, Amy Poehler, aside from being just a hilarious actress and wonderful comedian, like, she produced Broad City and, like, made these two hilarious women's dreams come true. I mean, they made it true for themsel- come true for themselves as well because they're obviously incredibly talented. Yeah, but I would say we also door. look up to the Broad City girls as yeah, well. Yeah, big time. And this is cheesy because she's one of my best friends, but Jillian Bell, she takes like so many risks and she said no like talk about feminism she has said no to so many things because they made her uncomfortable or like we're disrespectful to women so she's somebody I really look up to when it comes to like we get offered things that we're like should we take this and we'll talk to her about it because I mean obviously she's had said no and had such an amazing career yeah because that's really hard because there's so few opportunities you think can I really say no or can it be a stepping stone and it's gonna be okay right which is why I think it's just important for there to be female creators because then it just creates more roles for actresses. And more roles you want to do. Right. Are you a badass? Yeah. I think we're badass. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a word I would ever use to describe myself. How do you, how do you hear that word? A badass? Yes. Yeah. Someone who doesn't care what other people think. Oh. oh. That's not how you heard it. No, I think a badass is like like setting your mind to do something and actually doing it and not getting in your own way as much as possible. I mean, we're all human, so we all get in our own way sometimes. Okay. <laughs> is there anything we haven't talked about that you guys want to talk about? We were searching for new management this, oh, just yeah. talking about like Harvey and men and what we thought our careers were going to look like um we were searching for management and we got a meeting a lot of people said no at, for us as actor writers they just wanted to re- represent us on the lit side um so we only had a couple meetings and so before they even met you they would say no we're not we don't want to represent you as actors yeah. just yeah. as writers why because they're huge places i mean we were we were meeting with the top five management companies and i think they just don't have a ton of development i think if we met you know some of the more middle ground managers yeah they it, probably would have taken the meeting. So they're just super focused on what they're... Yeah, it's okay. not unusual. Um, and we don't have... You know, we're development. They're going to have to spend some time. And we're like, no spring chickens. We're not 18 years old. So it's not like... <laughs> it's like, why have we been... The question they ask is, why have we been around and not worked regularly? Because you're already aged out. I mean, I don't know if it's aged out, but the we're idea... Kind of in between ages, I would say. Like, we're aging out of playing high school. <laughs> Hopefully not before March. And you're not quite moms yet. Exactly. Right. Yeah, you're in that no man's land for women between 25 and 45. I don't know if I'll ever play a mom. You know what I mean? Like, I think me with a baby at my height with my voice and with what I put out is just, like, you not... Like teen mom. Yeah. <laughs> like, exactly. mom that shouldn't be mom. I don't know. I guess that's just the way I see myself. People might see me differently. I usually play, like, crazy roommate or, like, drug addict troll. Mm. Horse woman. Horse woman. <laughs> okay, so finish that story. You were looking for new management. Yeah, we ended up getting a meeting with a really... Our dream Our management. dream management company. We were pretty much set on signing with them. And the man that we met with said several things like, it's a good, it's a good time to sign you girls because women can do comedy now. <laughs> and he refused to shake my hand when I walked in the door. Said, we don't do that. Um, he also said he was... Well, hold on. We don't, we don't shake hands? I, right. I guess. Okay. What else? What else? He also said um, he, at the Emmys, was tired that he constantly had to give standing ovations for all the women that were winning. And, I, I mean, like, on it, obviously he didn't mean... He wanted to sign us. He didn't mean any disrespect. Like, he this was is just, just truly He was just oblivious. letting you know how put out he'd be by having to rep you and then applaud you and support your career. <laughs> that, I mean, that's what it felt like to us, but that's where the divide is. You know, this is where the education and the communication comes into play. Someone who's, you know, in their late 40s, early 50s, a white older male, that's their... Pers- I shouldn't say there. That's being generalizing. That was his... That was his <laughs> perspective. And he doesn't realize that it's offensive. Yeah, I mean, this was a meeting where he was courting us and saying these sort of things. So he he genuinely was just oblivious to 
how it was making us feel. So did you sign with that guy? No. no. <laughs> and it was, it was very difficult to be like, goodbye to a dream and the way I thought my career was going to shape out. How it, disappointing. Yeah, it was. And it was, st- and it was still a debate whether we were going to go with him or not. I know. That's what's so crazy. It's like the institution is such a big deal. Does it, does it, does it override, override the And person? is he an anomaly? No, he's there everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so did you find a new manager? We, we did. did. And we love her. And we love her. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Good. That gives me hope. Yeah. Did you tell her that story of that other guy? No. no we didn't. Mm-mm. We don't want to make her feel like we picked her by <laughs> default because we really didn't. We, we loved You weren't our favorite, but you turned out to be kind of a turd. No. So. You know, we were very nervous because we've had really bad experiences with managers. We've been through a couple, mm-hmm. all men, all mm-hmm. white men, all over 40. Um, and we we're like our agents were like this has to be it you can't be known as people that jump like it's not a good look so we were like it has to be the right person yeah and we only met with two places and we were like how do you make a decision based off of two places what if it's the wrong you know I think it was just anxiousness but then she just proved in our gut we knew it was her and then she just proved right away that she was the right decision what was different about how she approached you she just talked to us like we were human beings. Like, it wasn't like we were being interviewed. It was just, like, an actual conversation. It's just that easy? It, it, I mean, especially with management, it is. Like, you don't want to feel intimidated by people that ultimately you're hiring to work for you. You want right? to feel comfortable. Yeah, because ultimately they're representing you. Yeah. yeah. Okay, tell us, for people who don't know, the difference between the agent's role and the manager's role. That's something we're still figuring out, I think. Um, I would say the manager's role is to see the bigger picture, is to be like, this is where you're going to end up, and this is how we're going to get there. Mm -hmm. And also hold your hand and, like, be someone you can call and vent to and be like, you know, really discuss your career as a whole, where I think your agents. It's more like finding you a job to work. Yeah. They're focused on more of the... I mean, not all of them, but, like, the monetary sale as opposed to maybe your dreams and your hopes. Right. I don't take the supporting role on Grace for this episode because we could get you a role as a doctor. Right. Exactly. Which is never a conversation we've ever had. Hypothetical. I'm like, doctors, three CCs, (laughs) five. Okay. Is there anything else? Mm, No. Well, I don't see how you're not going to be super successful. Just saying. I guess time will tell. <laughs> no, we I'm just, telling you. We just wrote a movie, a kid's movie, because we wanted to like do some, everything we write we want to be in, and it's, a, it's such a pressure. Um, it makes everything tangled up in like emotion. So mm-hmm. we're like, let's just write something we know we can't play. Yeah. So we wrote a kid's movie. We saw It, and we were like so inspired by the kids in that movie where they're so great. Did you write a horror film? No. We wrote, like, a Goonies, but for girls. Yeah, like a girls' adventure movie. We just loved how the kids in it spoke like adults. Like, it wasn't stereotypical kid language. It was so specific. So, yeah, we wrote that, and then we were so excited about it, and we just turned it into everyone, and they were like, it's fine. We're working on rewriting it. (laughs) (laughs) Because it doesn't need to be a little bit better than fine. I guess. um, We had a read-through, and we were like, like it went so well so we were really shocked we were like they're gonna love this it's so different from anything we've done it's pg which we've never done we also i would say in general love everything we do like (laughs) any we'll be in a coffee shop writing and we'll we always read it out loud to see how it sounds yeah and we'll be like dying laughing at our own jokes high-fiving we, like, clear the communal table. Yeah, people hate us a lot. <laughs> if you come to Republic of Pie, don't sit by us. You're like, this is the best. It's yeah. so hilarious. And then yeah. we turn it in, and they're like, everything's spelled wrong, and nothing makes sense. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You just don't get it. And we're like, yeah. don't get it. We're like, take another read. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for having us. This was so fun.
You've been listening to The Other 50%, A History of Hollywood. I'm Julie Harris-Walker. I'd like to thank Selena Warren and Marissa Reed for sharing their story. And special thanks to Jay Rowey, Danny Rosner, and Allison McQuaid for the music. Please find us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or Podbay, and subscribe and leave a review. And of course, on our website, theother50percent.com, all spelled out in letters for added features, bios of our guests, and the merch. And now we're on YouTube. You'll start to see some of these interviews on video, this one in particular. You can also follow us on Facebook and on Twitter at Other50% and Instagram at Other50% Podcast. Thanks for listening. See you next time.